So we're going to start out and we're going to show you the way that we do an exam in our office. Um, this is not our office and that's the examination chair, but we're going to make the best of the situation and they even have a headlight for me to look in the mouth and so the point is the, the questionnaire that we use is, is in your packet. Everything that we say is in your packet. Every single slide that we will talk about that you'll see on the board is in, your, is in that little flash drive you got. Please feel free to use them. You're not going to steal them. It would be my pleasure to have you use these for any purpose legitimate. I mean, that's to say, you know, teaching. Uh, if you want to give these or share these or use them, claim them, whatever you want to do, please do. This is, this is my way of teaching and contributing to teaching, so feel free to use it. Every slide is on there. Uh, if you happen to see an animation that you that can't live without and you uh, email me, we'll, we'll send you that too. Because uh, some of the animations don't copy. In fact, we're having trouble with some of our animations, and so you'll have to bear with me. We have to, we, they, they're not showing on my PowerPoint, and they, they always have. So, okay. So right now we have Dr. Stump is filling out her medical history, and um, so many of our papers that we use in the office are in the memory stick. We have a few in the folder for you to follow along. So that's our uh, medical history, and the examination starts on page five. So that's where we will be starting. Typically, what we will do is we fax or uh, email, or we try and get these in the patient's hand ahead of time. Because if the patient has to come in, we say, then you have to come in 20 minutes to a half hour early to fill it all out. This information is very important. And so we're going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea and, 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 and sleep dentistry. And the first thing I could tell you, this is far more complicated than lowering the AHI. The AHI is the apnea hypopnea index. So we, in that AHI, we have the word apnea. And this disease that we're dealing is far more complicated than simply apnea. If it were that simple, um, life would be easy. And that's why we're talking. It's, uh, and if, you, if, if all you hear is apnea, you're, you're, you're getting a poor course. This is about the, the whole ball of wax. We want to incorporate as much dentistry, as much science as we can into this program. I think you'll be more than pleased at the, the amount we do. And again, I know Lee and Michael are active in the Academy of Oral and Systemic Health. I think this is where we're going with this. Um, this is just a part of what our capability is for oral and systemic health. And it's more than just that simple comp concept of getting rid of the apnea. Many times when a patient makes their appointment, we do ask them to fax or somehow or another electronically send their previous sleep study to us. And Dr. Moses reviews every single patient prior to them arriving. I also go over it. If there are medications on there, you know how medications change every second. We look up the medications to find out exactly what this medical history um, is all about for this particular patient. That way when our patient walks in the door, we are familiar with that patient, um, their medical situation. We also look at their sleep study and we look and see what type of apnea they have, how severe it is, et cetera. So Dr. Moses doesn't have to um, waste time talking. He knows everything that he needs to know or lots of things right off the bat. When we're doing the examination, I ask questions, he answers me, and it's not that he doesn't know the questions, but it just lets the patient know what we are examining. That way they know that they're getting a very, very thorough examination. That's our exam form. Feel free to use parts of it, all of it, or please, if you have good suggestions, please suggest back to us. Okay, how are you doing? Yeah, this is, an on, this is, this is the beginning of a relationship and we hope to communicate with everybody. And if you have problems, we're here for you. Um, I am the Moses, and I am customer rep for the Moses, and I'm here to help you solve problems if you have them, seriously. Don't hesitate to call. My phone number's all over. We take calls, we welcome calls. And if I don't take your call during hours, we, t we, do, we do business at night. I mean, it's much easier for me to talk 
unlimited uh, at, at home or in the car or whatever. So if you don't hear from me in, in, because I can't come to the phone in the office, that's good because I'm busy and that's good. But on the other hand, I usually get back at night if that's okay. Give me numbers and we'll get in touch. We do. I talk to people all the time. It's my pleasure. It's my way of learning and, and making whatever I teach better. It's very important. Almost finished with her medical history. Teresa is always also happy to talk to people on the phone. If you have any questions of, um, you know, the lab, feel free to call the labs. Um, all of our service centers, everyone is familiar with the appliances, and they're familiar with questions that doctors have regarding the appliances. So, you're pretty thorough. Our, our form is pretty <laughs> thorough. thorough. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear, and 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 it is important. Um, Do you want to put this on? No. Do you mind if I don't put my white gown on? Okay, thank you. Um, so, can I share this? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Jan is saying that she has high blood pressure and that she has some neck pain. You want, would you like to describe your neck pain so we I can... I think it's occupational. You think it's occupational. Okay. And uh, she's menopausal and that's what she checked on that form. And while she didn't uh, give us her neck size, do we know your neck size? So yes, 15. Her neck size is 15. Okay, so uh, sleep disorder symptoms. She says... That Second row, there's a whole bunch of seats. So you have loud snoring. I've been told. You've been told you have loud snoring. And then frequent awakenings. How many times a night would you say you wake up? Three to four? So, frequent awakenings, three to four, and she's talking about teeth clenching, and she's talking about nocturnal teeth grinding. Is that important? Yes. And, and you know, I went to dental school many years ago, but I've studied temporal mandibular disorders, and I taught in that at the University of Illinois and Michael Reese Hospital and other, I've taught at programs all over the world. And the fact is that they, they really didn't know much about tooth clenching and grinding. Now we have Dr. G. Levine in Canada is doing some wonderful work on it. But the other thing that's coming to, 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 to bear on this problem is that it is believed that clenching and grinding, more than just a release of tension and stress, is the body's attempt to dilate pharyngeal muscles to open the airway. That's a huge, huge uh, indicator then that we're on to something. And, uh, it's, it's, it's my lead in, is there a sleep breathing disorder? Is there an obstructive breathing event? Teeth grinding and clenching is an excellent clue that there is. Okay, so have you had a weight change greater than five pounds? And she checked yes. I'm glad you're sharing your confidence with us. And uh, wait a minute, have you had a weight change greater? Yes. And the yes is, I'm sorry, she lost? 15. 15. <laughs> Terrific. So maybe she'll talk about her diet plan on Sunday. Not easy, but yeah. Okay. And so she had, do you have difficulty breathing through your nose at night? That's a no. Do you have difficulty, um, have you ever been treated for difficulty breathing through your nose? And that's a no. And if you awaken during the night, is it difficult to fall back asleep? And that's a no. She said three to four times a night. On the average, how many hours a night do you sleep? And she said seven. And none of her family has a history of sleep disordered breathing sleep disorders, and then uh, she doesn't have the energy to Not do that I know of. daily activities. Mm -hmm. And she, interestingly, she's uh, circled that our usual sleep position she believes is on her side. And then she consumes alcohol once a month. And how often do you consume it within two hours of bedtime? That's a never. And so this is an interesting history. And uh, have you ever had a sleep study? No. And have you ever had a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea? And then, uh, let's see, has a CPAP device ever been recommended? And you said self-diagnosed. Do you have one? I do. Okay. Bought it on the internet. And you bought it on the internet. And how do you feel about it? Well, I'll tell you how she feels about it. She says that the mask leaks. She has improper mask fit. And? It's it's an adjustment, you know. It's a learning curve to get it to fit. Okay, 
Then we too on the, uh, the Epworth sleepiness scale. This is the Epworth scale because not that it was invented by Dr. Epworth, but it came from the Epworth Hospital in Australia. And so the, the Epworth is quite reproducible and that's uh, almost borderline objective in that um, so, uh, it's, it's being used so, uh, so with such uh, reliability and it's a measurement of, it is a subjective measurement of sleepiness. And she had uh, on this scale a three for sitting and reading, a two for watching television, and then three more ones in a row. So we have uh, five, eight. Eight is the score. And generally, it's again, it's a subjective scoring, but it is felt that over 10 is usually excessive daytime sleepiness. And you'll hear that referred to by, as EDS. And there's so many letters and, and uh, acronyms that you'll see in this field. If you have any question, we're using them, and you don't know what they mean, scream out, and we'll give you the full wording. Excessive daytime sleepiness is EDS. And so that's where she's at. So, okay, now we would do an examination. So, looking at, would you mind standing up? So looking at, Jan, Jan, what, what, what can we say? What would you say looking at? Anybody have anything to say, or you want me to just go? Okay. Oh boy. Well, what I'm saying, I don't know, what I'm saying is, I'm seeing a concave face. I'm seeing concave lower face. And so if you stand sideways, I'm, I feel that there's concavity there, and I'm su suspecting that maybe you have four bicuspid extraction orthodontics? Nope. Nope. Okay, and then, okay, to me, the other thing that's coming to mind is, I think this is a phenomenon that maybe, maybe you're not gonna remember that you had a pacifier when you were young. And I believe that a kid who sucks excessively on a pacifier with a lip shield and pulls in can have mid-face hypoplasia as a result of too much pacifier, because the face does a significant amount of growing in, in, in early childhood. And so that's the one thing I might suspect. But I see, but in any case, I see the concave face. And with the concave face, I'm expecting uh, less room for the tongue. OK. So then. Do you want to? What else? Do, we can do posture while she's standing. We can do posture. Wish. And we do an evaluation of posture. And so in my evaluation of posture, I would say, Stands at your side, you please. standing up straight? Okay. Higher eye? Higher eye is, uh, in my opinion, is her left. Higher, Higher ear. ear is her left. Shoulder? Higher shoulder is the left. Rest? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> oh, no, this is important. This really is important. And I'm saying that her right breast is higher. Hip. It, huh? Hip. Hip. Okay, so please raise it raise just a little second. Hips. Right, and I'm, that's as far as I can see. Okay. Let's on talk. From the side. Huh? I'm sorry. Or from the side. Just look straight ahead. Okay, straight ahead. So I'm seeing the, I want you to turn so they can look this way. Ears are in front of shoulders, but shoulders over Elbows over hips over knees looks pretty straight to me. Um, but that's resulting in a head forward posture. The head forward posture, what we're seeing is extension here. This is extension when it's bent here. And flexion here, because she's stretching here. That's what you have to do to get the head forward posture. The most important thing that I'm seeing, well, it's all important. But what I want to relate in this looking at posture is this. If you see a person. And all the lines, higher ear, higher shoulder, higher eye, higher breast, higher hip, they're all parallel. That's most likely going to be an ascending problem. She can have one leg shorter than the other. Okay? But if you're starting to see it like this, then you have twisting. You have torsion. And so now you're looking at, they're balancing the head on the spinal column, and that's what you're seeing. And so when you're balancing the head on the spinal column, because there's an irregularity either in the bite or the neck or the back, and you're going to see the lines non-parallel, then that's an indication of descending problem. So 
if I see an ascending problem, this is the kind Harold Gelb used to talk about in the 70s, he'd say, put a heel lift in there, whatever else you do. Okay, because it's starting up this way. But if I start to see this, I'm thinking, okay, this is the kind of problem we're gonna deal with here. Uh, and so, could this be, you know, related to what we're looking at? Yes, I consider all that relevant. Incidentally, that part of the exam, I just, it's out of sequence, but it was on the next page. All right. So, any questions on that? Okay, let's go on. Hand sanitization. Hand sanitization. You know, we're looking for sleep disorders. And in reality, this is oral and systemic health. It's way more complex. And so... So the first thing we always give our patient is some lip balm. So may I give you a souvenir? We Sears Tower very, lip balm. Very hard that the lips look as good when they leave as they came in, and we don't want to see them all cracked and bleeding. So the other thing is we're going to stretch them to do all this, and so. Do you like that? Mm -hmm. We have some for everybody later. And. The, yes, it's just it's got my name on it, so it's just another little form of uh, internal marketing, and uh, it's a good, it's a very nice thing. They make these up with your name on them, and they're very reasonable. So, okay. Tongue size. Okay, open, and let's look. All right, uh, it's a shame we don't have the uh, um, live feed, but what I'm looking at is scallop orders of the tongue, and so. If you stick it out, maybe you can see a little bit, but I see it. Even when she sticks it out, I see the scallop border, and we want to see a nice, round, smooth border. Now, there's another thing. Stick out your tongue again, and look up, put it up. And so we're going to look and see if there's a little bit of tongue tie. And so here's another indication. If you close, and can we get a, where's the measure stick? Yeah. So... We use these little wafers, in this case they're from Great Lakes Orthodontics as they're advertising. And open as wide as you can, and I got nice, a 54 millimeters opening there. And the next thing is, put your tongue in the roof of your mouth, the tongue in the roof of the mouth, now open, leave your tongue there, flat as you can in the roof of your mouth, how wide can you open. And now, it's interesting, it's about 28. And so if you got that two to one ratio, if it's less than that, less smaller than the two to one, the chances are gonna be good that there's a tongue tie whether you see it or not. But then when you're looking at the tongue tie, you're gonna look and say, well, you see a, a little kiss, the heart shape on the end of the tongue. And if you see that little split on the end of the tongue, there is uh, gonna be some tongue tie. Is tongue tie important? Yes, because in my mind, and we, we talked about design of the Moses, I want the tongue to touch the lips. I want to make the most room I can. If you can't get the tongue forward, this is a problem. And so we want to think about tongue tie as a factor in making decisions, clinical decisions on what to do. Okay, so. The tongue size. Okay, the next thing is we didn't talk much. Do you have any problem with sounds? Can you, artic yeah, can you articulate all the letters? No speech problem. Okay. That's another good clue, because when they have a speech problem, if you listen to children, as we talk, and you hear that speech problem, first you gotta think tongue tie. And so, these are important things, especially in children. Okay. Tongue size. Tongue size, it looks normal to me. Okay. So under characteristics, we have scallop borders, and we are not considering her a tongue tie, correct? Correct. Um, any fissuring? Open. Okay. We'll show pictures later, but it's a very uniform surface of the tongue. And so no fissuring of the tongue, no longitudinal fissuring. What if there was? What if there was? If there was, you're getting ahead of me. Okay. That's three <laughs> lectures from now. But the reason, the reason though, that's the reason that's important is because I feel that when you see that midline fissure, I feel that they're, fish, they're folding the tongue to get it to fit in the mouth. So if I see the fissure in the middle of the tongue, my assumption is, the tongue probably doesn't want to fit in the mouth the way it is. It's being folded. Okay, good question. I'm sorry. Okay. Welcome. Okay, next question. Dr. Signo just arrived. Hello, Dr. Signo. 
um, nasal passages. Okay, nasal passages. So lips together, and then I want you to inhale as deep and fast as you can through your nose. Okay, and the reason of what I'm looking for in that, that's called the sniff test. What I'm looking for in the sniff test is, do the nares constrict or do the nares flare? The reflex is that the nares should flare because your, your diaphragm is demanding as much air as it possibly can and the reflex for the most of the, much of the nasal resistance originates in the nasal valve. But we have a reflex and the reflex says that when you want the maximum, will flare open and so that's a reflex and so if the if the nares flare that's probably going to be a competent nasal breather but if the nares go in then we have nasally obstructed breathing this is a good clue is it 100 percent accurate it's pretty close and this is what this is what the ENTs will look at a lot and so it's, that's the sniff test on our exam form it says nasal passages and then there are some other um, septal deviation etc we have already at this point in the exam gone through the ICAT scan that we've taken on our patients. So we already know the answers to that question. And we, will, we have many um, ICAT samples and uh, panoramic x-rays and whatnot to show you later. So yep. we're going to circle nose breathing under breathing because but that's what we... The other thing you're going to see also and you're going to make note is you'll see one side constrict and the other side flare because that's unilateral nasal obstruction. You're going to see that way more than you think, and it's common. So, there. So, Malampati? Sniff test is important. Malampati. We have a, you have a picture of what Malampati is going to look like. So you're going to open wide, take your tongue out, and go, ah. ah. Okay. I can't see any airway when she does that, so I'd say a four. Tonsil grading score? I don't see any, I don't see, I don't see the airway, I'm not going to see the tonsils. Okay, but just because I want to look, I'm going to look. Uh, I'm still not going to see. Let's, let's try it. I still don't see. You got tonsils? Yes. She's got them. Okay, but I just can't see them. Okay. Swallow? Okay, swallow. Okay, what I'm looking at is, I'm going to swallow. Open up and stick your tongue. I'm going to see the lateral borders of the tongue. She's got a lateral tongue thrust. She's swallowing with her tongue between her teeth. The next question is open up and look, put it out gently in front. Okay. To me, it's a lateral tongue thrust. I'm not seeing the, yeah, I am seeing the scallop border in the front. So anterior and anterior lateral. Anterior and lateral. Any tori? So. Why don't we see an anterior open bite? Because her lips are competent. And so this is all figuring into the equation. Pardon? You don't. No, you do not. That's what I'm saying. You don't. So you have competent lips. Your lips are keeping them in. They're open. But are they, the battle is being won by the tongue because we're still seeing spaces between distal to the lateral incisors. teeth. She thinks she has small teeth. And that's the old orthodontic argument. The orthodontic argument, your teeth are too big and therefore you need four bicuspids out. That's not a, that argument doesn't work anymore. The four bicuspid extraction means that you're making the tongue box too small for the tongue. And, and, and the tongue is bigger than the tongue box and I'm seeing spaces. I never had braces. I still have my third molars and I have space. Then your tongue, that's all, that, that, that suggests to me that the tongue is not fitting, the tongue wants to come forward. And, that, and if there's not enough room for the tongue, and you close your mouth to sleep because your nose is working, that's suggesting to me that your airway is going to be small, and I'm, I'm, I'm buying apnea, and we're going to see tonight. I buy apnea too, I just... Okay, but, that, okay. but I'm seeing all the physical signs of it. Okay. These are not obvious. They weren't obvious to you. Yeah. Okay, and that's the way I'm reading it. Tori? Okay. Oh, sorry. Again. In a normal swallow, the teeth touch in central conclusion. The tongue is in the roof of the mouth. If, you can't, if there's not enough room for the tongue, the teeth don't touch, and then the tongue squirts out the side. She's swallowing like that. Tongue, okay, you're agreeing with me. I'm glad. Shake your hands. Okay. But uh, these, these are important um, 
tells as to what's going on. Okay. Oh, well. Tori. Tori. See, you can look, and you all know what a tori looks like, and we're looking for both maxillary and I don't see any. And mandibular. Shape of the maxilla. Okay. Shape of the maxilla, nice broad U shape, and mandible, great, beautiful dental arches. Occlusion. Close and bite, please. Okay. And what I'm seeing here is class one on the right, class one on the left. You all know what that looks like. I'm seeing open again. It looks like two millimeters of overbite, close, and it looks like I'm seeing two over jet. So no bicuspid extraction. Any crossbites? No. Step plane of occlusion. This is not enough room for the tongue. Okay, let's go back. Here's another assumption. If you have tonsils, the kid is growing up, and this, here's this um, uh, four-year-old kid, this three-year-old kid, two-year-old kid, any young child, and they have tonsils like golf balls. We've all seen that, right? Okay, when you have a kid with those tonsils, it's not reasonable to expect that that tongue is going to swallow normally. That tongue could be made to swallow like this because there's not enough room to get the bolus of food down with those two big tonsils there. So we have an adaptive swallow. So the questions we might want to ask is that she's also still got her tonsils. She never had them out. Does that play a role in this? Maybe. Maybe. And so uh, that's one important thing that we can think about as well. So step plane of occlusion? Okay. Step plane of occlusion would be that the front six are higher than the posterior eight? And the answer is yes. So what's happening is, the, you, if you look again, she's going to have, and if we had models, you lay those, that upper arch, it's going to lay flat. We have flat plane of occlusion on the upper. But the upper has to occlude with the lower. What's happening? The lower has to go back and up. Okay, so the, for the upper, the lower to go back and up, the condyles are going distal in the be this sleep position in the fossa, and the muscles are going to be overclosed. Again, all this is not room for the tongue. Midline. Close. Midline, about a half a millimeter to the right of center. Left side, both yeah, yes. sides or none? There's four, okay. there's four possible answers. Right side, left side, both sides or none. Okay. okay. Anterior temporalis? Speak of the microphone. Slight, both. Posterior temporalis? No. Masseter? It's hard to find when you're upside down. Upside backwards, right? Slight, both sides. Upper trapezius? Upper trapezius. Hold it there. Okay. No. Mid trapezius? Mid trapezius. Right here. Yeah, both sides. That's pretty hard. Really. Low trapezius, even okay. though that's not the harsh. idea is to be consistent, and I am. And okay. she's saying it hurts more, but she thinks I'm squeezing harder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not. Not. Okay, important. Mm -hmm. Why are you hurting me there? Why do those ter those pterygoids never hurt before? We need to, you know, how come they're tender? How about here, lower trapezius? No. Okay. Medial pterygoid, extra oral. Medial pterygoid, extra oral. Okay, right there. No. SCM? No. SCM, easy. Right here. No. Okay. Splenius capitis? Now here, so for splenius capitis, I just go down, and I'm with the, with the uh, uh, SCM in between my fingers. It's immediately behind it. That's a no. No. Okay. And scalenes? Yes. No. Okay. Scalenes are accessory breathing muscles. Where does this come into play? This comes into play because we're going to talk about carbon dioxide, hopefully. And with the carbon dioxide, if, the carbon, if a patient is mouth breathing, then their neck and shoulder breathers, their neck and shoulder muscles are more apt to be tender. If they're diaphragmatic breathers, they're going to have less of the accessory breathing muscles than the neck and shoulders be tender. Escalinus is a good one for that. Okay, next. Mylohyoid intraoral. 
Mylohyoid intraoral, easy enough. We're going to go here and here. It's hard, to, it's hard to answer when my fingers are in your mouth. <laughs> I know that. She's very good. Temporalis okay. tendon. Okay, temporalis tendon, you all know where that is. And open wide as you can. And I grab for the tendon right there. And that's a no as well. Medial pterygoid. And medial pterygoid is open wide as you can. We're going to grab the sides of the fossa. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. That was a yes. <laughs> That's a yes, bilateral. And then I'm going to ask you to close a little, close a little, and shift as far to the left as you can, and I'm going to find lateral yeah. pterygoid. That was a yes on lateral pterygoid. And on the right side, uh -huh. she, yes. TMJ okay. lateral to the joint. TMJ lateral to the joint. Anybody doesn't know where that is, raise your hand, and then go to, go to your room. Go to the next room for a snack. <laughs> no? No. Okay, open and close. No. And then TMJ through the EAM. TMJ through EAM means external auditory hiatus. Close, open. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the oldest joke in the world. Okay. Didn't Can I have your gloves, please? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I can't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. Okay. All right. Okay, questions? The, 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 the breathing muscles are important. You don't want to get into it. You want good records. Now, this is an interesting point because, again, we're going to... Anybody here not a general yes, dentist? And then, um, so we're general we, dentists, we basically. The for the but yet, you want to be the in this again? business, okay. we're going to look for referrals from medical specialists. Yes, they're going to be in your practice, and that's why we're going to talk. And so I think the Metabyte is extremely valuable because if you do this kind of an exam for your patient's routine, Question? Yes. Uh, today we assume when uh, the jaw is too small for the teeth that the teeth are okay, we've got to expand the jaw. What makes the tongue too big for the jaw? Would you review that, please? I don't think, okay. I don't, yes. I don't believe that she had macroglossia. I believe she had micronasia for what reasons? Um, again, can the teeth be too small? You see, orthodontists today, these guys are all uh, um, what I call cephalo, cephalometrists. And what they basically do as a cephalometrist is they measure bony landmarks and then decide if this patient were ideal on the basis of a skeletal profile where they should be. And then they take and move the teeth there. And I think what we have to be is functionalists. We have to say, how are they breathing, how are they swallowing, and how is the head posture? And I think that's the approach. The idea that the teeth um, need to, um, I, okay, I don't believe that there's a genetic difference because somehow when you look in the animal kingdom, you never see small teeth in big spaces. The teeth are genetically suited to fit. And, and so I don't believe that, that, that the teeth are too small. Now why, why do we have what we have in her mouth? How come if all that's the case, that we have these spaces in our two front teeth here, and yet the teeth are not too small. And the reason I think is because if I look at her face, that's the first thing I said is I think her whole dentition should be out a half a centimeter or more. And so if the whole dentition were out here, the space would generate would be back here. Okay, how does that space get generated that's functional movement, and I think it started with large tonsils. And also, the other possibility is that she had a pacifier. She's a, she's a competent nasal breather. So if a kid, you, you, you know, a patient says, do your kid take a pacifier? And you say, the mother says, no, I'm lucky. My kid spit it out all the time. <laughs> that poor kid spit it out because he's a mouth breather. That's serious. That's, but then the other extreme is, that, so the kid couldn't take it in because he needed his mouth to breathe. That's the kid when you see the hung like this. The kid, there's thumb propping and there's thumb sucking. So, but I think what happened in her case is, here's the concave face. The other possibility is she sucked on a pacifier. The nose is working. She told us that. Here's this kid. She's sucking on his pacifier all the time. Um, so she's, there's a concave face. There's an answer. I don't know all the answers, but that's the way I look. That's the way the clues stack up.